Um, okay, folks, um, I, I see people are still joining, which is great, um, but let, maybe we can get started um, and, then, and then folks can, um, can, jump, can jump in um, into, the, into the conversation. So first of all, thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, welcome everyone uh, on behalf of the BC Health Coalition and Canadian Doctors for Medicare. Um, thank you for joining us on this public webinar about the very important CAMBI case. My name is Osman Mushtaq and I'm with the BC Health Coalition. I'm speaking to you today from the unceded and stolen territories of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh. I want to take a moment today to acknowledge, acknowledge um, just how important these land acknowledgements are. Um, and yet they're just the first tiny step of what I uh, and other settlers can do. Um, you know, we, we couldn't have a, a land acknowledgement this week without acknowledging the horrifying news uh, this week about the Kamloops Residential School, which just shows how much work we still need to do as settlers and that we haven't even begun to understand the impacts of our, of our settler colonialism. So as Indigenous communities in BC and, and really across Turtle Island deal with this continued trauma, I'll be remembering to hold our settler government more accountable, educating myself and other settlers and trying to amplify indigenous voices. With this in mind, I encourage you to post your name in the chat, the name of the traditional territories on which you live. And if you are a settler in Turtle Island, one action you'll be taking towards reconciliation. And you can you can post that in the chat through the through the webinar. Um, but I yeah I encourage all of us to do that today. Now let's return to the topic we're we're here to talk about. Today we want to give you an update on the Canby case as we head into the appeals process in a couple of weeks, um, in in less than two weeks really. Um, and we wanted to give you an update on the launch of our public campaign in support of our actions in court. As we all know, the court of public opinion is just as important as, um, as, as legal court. So um, today we'll, we'll show you how you'll be able to pledge your support uh, for public health care and how you, can, um, how you can do your part in um, this campaign um, where, we're, where we're going to court to defend public health care. We'll have some speakers today talking about the case and uh, about why they're involved with the case. And of course, we'll have some time for questions um, that you might have as well. Before we get started, a couple of quick technical notes. Throughout the presentation, please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box. Uh, for those of us who are, who are new to the Q&A box, um, on the bottom of your screen, towards the, the right side, you'll, you'll see a, a little button labeled Q&A. So if you click on that, you'll be able to submit your questions. We are encouraging you to submit your questions you know, into that box at any time during the webinar. And when we get to the Q&A portion, we'll, we'll try to get through um, the questions. Um, and we'll do our best to address them all, all the questions. And of course, you know, if we don't get your question, We'll try to follow up with the participants with more information and links um, as uh, you know on how to engage with our campaign. Um, the other thing I should mention is that this webinar and the Q&A portion will be recorded and we'll have this recording available afterwards for viewing and if you know people who wanted to make it to this webinar but um, could not uh, they'll have a chance to watch the the webinar and, and we'll we'll talk about um, how they can get involved with, the, with this case as well. With all that said, now I'll hand it over to Katie Arnup to introduce our first speaker. Thank you so much, Osman. And thank you everyone for joining us today uh, and sharing where you're calling in from. Uh, my name is Katie Arnup and I'm the Executive Director of Canadian Doctors for Medicare. And it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Melanie Bichard, who is the Chair of CDM and a Pediatric Emergency Medicine Physician in Ottawa. Melanie is gonna give us a bit of an overview of the Canby case. Um, so over to you, Mel. Thank you very much, Katie. Hopefully everyone can see my slides. Please give me a shout if you cannot. Okay, great. So I'll be talking a little bit about the background of this long saga called the Canby Trial. So we start with some good news. 
We had a decisive victory in September of 2020. BC Supreme Court Justice John Steves probably phrased our case better than I could. And I think some of this really is worth reading out loud. The introduction of duplicative private healthcare would increase demand for public healthcare, reduce the capacity of the public system to offer medical care, increase the public system's costs, create perverse incentives for physicians, increase the risk of ethical lapses related to conflicts between the private and public practices of physicians, undermine political support for the public system, and exacerbate inequity in access to medically necessary care. Indeed, it would create a second tier of preferential healthcare where access is contingent on a person's ability to pay. And this is just one impactful paragraph from a very long document detailing Justice Steve's decision. Now, what are some key takeaways from that decision? One of them was that an expansion of private care would not reduce wait times in the public system. In fact, it would likely make them worse. We also noted that there would likely be a lot of inequity in who could access care. We might be reducing wait times for a very small portion of the population that's wealthy and healthy, but the vast majority of Canadians would have worse access to necessary care. We do know that wait times are a problem in Canada. Evidence does suggest that typically, if there's urgent or emergent care, it's almost always provided in a timely manner. However, we're not doing a great job for some of those semi-urgent or elective procedures. The good news is that there has been a lot of innovations, not in how we pay for care, but how we deliver care that has really reduced wait times for patients. So we have full confidence that we can tackle these issues within our public system without completely dismantling it. We also noted that privately financed healthcare, again, undermines equitable access to care, and studies from around the world actually show that having a multi-payer system is less sustainable than a single payer one. Countries like Germany, Switzerland, Austria, all pay more for their care than we do, and they do have the multi-payer system. So these are important things to keep in mind, and thankfully were brought to light during the CANBY trials first iteration. I should note that it has been a really long journey. The CANBY case started in September of 2016, and ended in February of 2020. So as a pediatric doctor, I feel the need to mention that if a child was born when the CANBY trial began, by the end of the trial, they would likely be able to jump on one foot, maybe do a bit of skipping rope, would know over 500 words and would put them together and tell stories. So it was a long trial. And there really was a decade of advocacy before, during, and as we'll see, after that first phase of the trial. So what exactly was being challenged in the CANBY trial? Well, the plaintiffs, so Dr. Brian Day and his supporters, were challenging three main sections of the Medicare Protection Act. The first one was limitations on extra billing and user fees. Right now, if I am charged $30 for a medical procedure, that's what I would pay or have the public system pay. But maybe my doctor decides that they're really good at that procedure or maybe the cost of supplies have gone up, or maybe the doctor just wants an in-ground pool. If there were no limits on extra billing, that doctor could charge $40, $50 for that same procedure. The other aspect that was being challenged was limits on private duplicate insurance. Right now, we can't get private insurance for services that are currently publicly covered under provincial and territorial public health plans. However, if this limit were removed, we would then be able to get private insurance that might cover those procedures and care, but might also give a few extra perks. Maybe I could get private insurance so that I could be seen a little bit faster at the doctor's offices, almost like your fast pass at Disney World. Maybe if I didn't get that private insurance, I could simply pay out of pocket for faster care. And it's clear to see how this disproportionately works in the favor of people who are either healthy, wealthy, or both. And then the third section of the BC Medicare Protection Act that was challenged was limits on dual practice. As it stands right now in British Columbia, physicians can work and bill within the public system or within the private system if they're at their own clinic and not in a hospital area. This isn't true necessarily for every province, but this is a limit that the plaintiffs are challenging on the BC Medicare Protection Act. So for those of us not in British Columbia, what implications does this case have across the country? 
Well, a lot of the provincial and territorial laws have legislation that's analogous to the BC Medicare Protection Act. If the BC Medicare Protection Act is found to be non-constitutional or unconstitutional, then that likely means that our legislation in other provinces and territories would also not stand. All of these pieces of law are also based on the Federal Canada Health Act. So if BC's act is found to be unconstitutional, it would be very easy to suggest that the Canada Health Act is unconstitutional and then we would really not have a leg to stand on in terms of enforcing the Canada Health Act. We would lose those principles of publicly available, portable, comprehensive, universal care. It's really important to remember as well that this is another step in the journey, but regardless of the outcome of the appeal, it's almost certain that either the plaintiffs or defendants will bring the case to the Supreme Court of Canada. So we were really successful in that first step and it's largely due to the effects of many advocates in the Safe Medicare Coalition. So thank you so much everyone for all the great work you've done. But we also acknowledge that there's a lot of work to do ahead. So what would a loss actually look like for the Canby case? Well, we all recognize that we share a border with the United States and there's a lot of geographic and cultural similarities. There are many private insurance companies within the United States that would love to have access to the 36 million or so Canadians if the Canada Health Act was removed. Quite rapidly, we would have an American style healthcare system. It's pretty clear to think that this would happen because prior to the Canada Health Act, Canada's system was nearly identical to the United States healthcare system. And again, we've often said that Dr. Brian Day has the right diagnosis, but the wrong treatment for wait times. We recognize that creating this multi-tiered, multi-payer system would actually increase wait times for the vast majority of Canadians. So where are we now and what are the next steps? Well, within 48 hours of Justice Steve's monumental decision, the plaintiffs and supporters filed an appeal notice. The Safe Medicare Coalition, which consists of the BC Health Coalition, Canadian Doctors for Medicare, and all of our experts, patient and doctor interveners, have once again been granted intervener status of the appeal. So we're looking forward to that. One thing to note is that the appeal this time won't be focused on the healthcare content and issues. It will be focused more on the legal rationale and legal reasoning behind Justice Steve's initial decision. So we have to brace ourselves for some very complex legal debates. The hearing for the appeal begins June 14th, um, 2021. And as for the timeline, the most specific one that I can provide is to be determined. We don't know quite how long this appeal will take, hopefully shorter than the initial Candy case. The four-year trial is apparently one of the longest trials in Canadian history. So we're hoping that we will have maybe a faster resolution this time. But again, no matter what happens at this appeal step, we are almost certain that this case will proceed to the Canadian Supreme Court. So thank you very much to everyone who has done the work, educated themselves on this issue, generated support and fundraised to help us along this long journey. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Melanie. Uh, next, we want to hear from people who can shed some light on just at what just what's at stake in this case um, on a personal level. Uh, so joining us today, we have Tom McGregor, who is one of the patient interveners in our coalition interveners group. Tom has a progressive neurological condition of muscular dystrophy. He has worked for many years as a disability rights advocate in BC, and as such has worked with many campaigns involving systemic and individual rights for people with disabilities. Tom, take it away. Hi, thank you for having me here today for this important issue. Um, the, one of the things that uh, when this case started, um, I was with a progressive disability, I was walking with a cane at that time. Now I'm uh, fully in a wheelchair uh, and uh, have very limited use of of most of most of my uh, 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 muscles. Um, but in that time, the healthcare system has been there for me. When I when I when I had to transition from uh, cane to uh, walker, 
uh, I had access to an occupational therapist to make sure that I had the right equipment and that it wasn't too early for me to be doing these, the, to be relying on this equipment. When I needed a, when I needed to go from a, a cane to a walker, I got the right walker again because of an occupational therapist. Same thing when I needed a wheelchair, a bath commode, all those things took time and, and medical appointments with occupational therapists. There was a period where I had uh, spent a couple of weeks in a hospital because I'd lost uh, uh, a, a, a huge amount of my ability, uh, mobility at one time. Um, having access to 10 days in the hospital and then getting sent to uh, GF Strong for rehab, that's very important and essential to me as an individual. If I was to lose those things, I, I, I can't imagine uh, where my health would be. Um, as a person who worked with many people uh, uh, advocating for their rights, uh, user fees are, are a huge issue for people with disabilities. And so to uncap them and to have uh, unfettered amounts of, of money being needed for things like doctor's notes, for the referrals to other physicians and stuff, would just be way too expensive for the average person with a disability who are on the lower end of the social economic spectrum. So this is a very important issue. Um, I know that uh, the free hand of the marketplace isn't there to lift me up, but I know that the healthcare system uh, as it is now can be. So thank you. Thanks so much uh, for sharing that, Tom. Um, so, uh, so Mal has been speaking a bit about, about the case and Tom shared some of his stories. Uh, both of them are, are happy to answer any questions you might have about the case. And Katie and I will take turns directing your questions to them. Um, so um, if you haven't had a chance, please um, ask your questions in the Q&A box. We'll also take a. Uh, we'll also be monitoring the chat. If um, you know, if you can't figure out the Q and A box, you can post your questions in the in the chat box, and and we'll we'll monitor that. Um, and as you're submitting your questions, if there's a if there's a particular person you'd like your question to be directed to, please um, please let us know. Please indicate that when you're submitting a question. Otherwise, we'll um, we'll we'll be happy to direct your question. So, so we have another question. Um, I have seen media coverage that says um, they're helping to reduce wait time. So this is this is a claim that Brian Day often makes about about reducing wait times. Um, and and so um, again, Katie or or Melanie, um, would would one of you be able to address this this question? I can start in terms of other ways to reduce wait times. Perfect. So um, a lot of the innovations have been happening on a local or regional level. So we've seen small things like having a centralized referral system can really reduce wait times for patients. And there was an orthopedic surgeon, I think in Alberta, who piloted this many years ago, but they basically saw that if family doctors referred to a group of surgeons and the patients are then allocated to the surgeons with the lowest wait list, they are not waiting nearly as long as the current system, whereby a lot of primary care providers are simply referring to specialists that they've always referred to, simply because they know them or they're just not aware of other people within their area. And of course, that can lead to some specialists being completely inundated with long wait times. It could lead to other specialists you know, with much shorter lists. So simply by centralizing this process a little bit, it can really speed up wait times. It's like at the bank where everyone gets in one line for the multiple bench with four different tellers rather than everyone lining up in front of each individual teller with lines of different lengths. Kind of a useful analogy. Another aspect which has been helpful too is looking at getting patients some intermediary care while they're on these long wait lists. So what might that look like? I think there is a spine surgeon who had noticed there were really long wait times to see this neurosurgeon who focused on spinal surgeries and recommended that patients receive physical therapy and a multidisciplinary assessment while they're waiting a year or so to see the surgeon. So a lot of patients' symptoms greatly improved by the time they saw the surgeon. Many did act not actually need surgery. 
So by making use of our multidisciplinary allied health professionals, by looking at centralized wait lists, there's things that we can do and have done to improve wait times. I think the trouble is that a lot of these stories remain very localized and aren't always communicated with other areas. So there's definitely a lot more work we can and should do to advocate for improved wait times. Thank you, Mel. And um, also adding to, to that, um, uh, and the, the original question around hearing that um, private um, duplicative care or insurance would help uh, reduce wait times. Um, we know that that isn't true. And Justice Steve's decision found that it isn't true after you know, a decade of evidence. Um, but uh, unfortunately, when they can't necessarily get away with lying in the court, um, there's some bending of the truth when the other side is speaking to the media. And that's why it's so important that we have you know, all of you here today um, to hear the evidence and to be involved in a, in a campaign and to support public health care. Um, so uh, we have a question from Victoria who had to pay for unnecessary spinal surgery in Calgary. Um, and Victoria asks, how do we ensure that patient victims um, of unnecessary surgeries um, or, or um, surgical errors are protected through the public health care system? Um, Mel, Melanie, as, as, as a doctor, do you have any, do you have any thoughts on that? Absolutely. First, Victoria, I'm sorry that happened to you. It sounds like you've really been through it. And I hope things are doing a bit better now. In terms of a system level for how we protect patients, I do think the public system is well set up to protect patients. Of course, we all know of instances where this does not happen. But of course, I do encourage any patient who has concerns about care that they receive to get in touch with your provincial or territorial college of physicians and surgeons. They're more than happy to investigate complaints and concerns that you might have. I think we've seen in other instances that there can be what we call perverse incentives for physicians who are more focused on profits rather than patients. And there has been various studies done looking into circumstances where for-profit systems can often lead to lower quality of care than in publicly funded systems. There is a little bit of evidence from the Veterans Affairs Hospitals within the United States that shows relatively high quality of care within those public areas. Um, and we've also seen, unfortunately, closer to home here in Canada, the big disparities in outcomes between for-profit long-term care facilities and then municipally owned or publicly funded long-term care. So it's not to say necessarily that having this avenue would necessarily make every physician completely driven towards profit but it does create a little bit of an incentive and it does create an incentive for physicians to act inequitably. If I'm paid more to see a richer patient, I think it can be hard for some physicians to say no to that. So there is a lot of advantages, both in terms of medical quality of care by having that single payer publicly funded system. Thank, thanks, Melanie. So we have a- uh, Great. Um, we also have a question from Janet. Uh, what can allies in the community <clears throat> do to support this work? Um, thank you so much. Um, and we're gonna be talking a little bit about that very soon. Um, we do have a, a campaign to show public support uh, for public health care. Um, we, we don't know how much media coverage the appeals hearing will have uh, the week of June 14th. Um, but we anticipate uh, both sides will be we're trying to get attention. Uh, so if you do see an article, please feel free to write uh, a letter to the editor um, and to share through your networks. Um, and there will also be opportunities uh, to tune into the trial um, as it will be held over Zoom publicly. Um, thanks, thanks for all these questions, folks. Uh, we're still we're still getting more questions. So. Um, um, if, uh, if you haven't had a chance to ask, ask your question, please, uh, please go ahead and, and do so. So th these are great questions. So we have another question from um, uh, Ivor. Um, in, the, in the event they were to succeed, what would be the drain on the public health system as a result of doctors, nurses, medical technicians, allied health, health professionals opting to leave for better pay and working conditions? Um, and um, that's that's a great question. Um, I'm I'm wondering um, 
Um, Melanie or, or Katie, would you, would you want to answer um, that question? I'd be happy to start. So that's a great question. As we know, we have a finite number of physicians and health professionals in Canada, and they have a finite number of working hours. So even if we created a system in which physicians can both work publicly and privately, they're still going to be spending less hours and less time in that public system. So that's why we do believe that in other systems where they've created these multiple tiers of financing, uh, the wait times have gotten a lot longer in the public system. You're essentially taking away resources from the public system, which let's be honest, are often the patients who are less healthy and less wealthy than those who can afford to be within the private system. And that's a long reason why we would have those increased wait times. So it is something that I would really worry about encountering. I do think that you know, making physicians and nurses' lives and careers better within the public system is also a really important objective to achieve. But much like wait times, I have full confidence that we can make medical careers better within our publicly funded system. And I've never practiced medically within the United States, but I just finished completing my master's in public health with Johns Hopkins University and got a chance to work with many physicians and colleagues who were practicing in the, in the United States system. And there are supremely high levels of burnout, which is also a problem here in Canada. But at least I know the vast majority of my patients won't be turned away because they can't afford care. And I couldn't imagine not only the emotional toll of dealing with that, but also the huge administrative burden it would take on physicians and nurses who would have to complete paperwork and advocate for physicians to get reimbursement. There's so many issues with private insurance companies and what they define as eligible procedures and eligible providers. It's so complex, it's really difficult for health economists to even grasp. So I'm really eager to stay within our single payer system because I do think that overall it's likely better for patients as well as healthcare professionals. Um, I'll, uh, thanks, thanks for that, Mel, um, Melanie. Um, I'll, I'll just add one, one other thing. Um, in, in the media, uh, Brian Day will often talk about the, the Charuli case in, in Quebec and, and he'll reference that case often. Um, and and just, to, just to add on to what Melanie was saying, there, there was a study in Quebec that found that after the Charuli ruling, more physicians chose to opt out of the public system. So exactly what, exactly what you were saying, Melanie, you know, there's, there's, there's an opting out going, um, not just for physicians, but for other um, health professionals as well. And, and again, that, that doesn't help us um, keep capacity in the public healthcare system um, for, for those of us who aren't uh, wealthy or, or healthy. <clears throat> okay, another question we have um, is that a common uh, refrain um, sort of on the other side um, is that in the public healthcare system, uh, patients don't get the choice of the specialists they get to see or, or who, they, who they see and that this is about choice. So should we not be increasing the number of doctors we have in our public system? Um, and what would you say around patient choice? Mel, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, that's a great question. I think as much as possible, it is wonderful when patients can have a choice in their healthcare providers. It's so special to meet somebody who does share your values and particularly for more prolonged treatments or especially psychotherapy, finding that good fit is really crucial. I think a lot of that can come with having more healthcare providers in public systems. There might be a little bit more role for patient choice um, or sorry, in private systems, there might be a little bit more role for patient choice, but again, you might be increasing the choice available to the healthy and wealthy few, whereas the vast majority of people remaining in the public system would likely have less choice of providers because either there'd be fewer providers working in that system or the providers wouldn't be spending as much time in that system. So patient choice, it's important as much as we can, and it's wonderful to be able to work into our system at any point possible, um, but it is something that should not be available to only a select few. Thanks, Melanie. Um, so um, 
we have we have another question, um, and and this might uh, we're we're getting towards the end of our of our Q and A time, so this might be one of um, yeah we we might ask one more question um, after this if, if there are any. Uh, so this question is from Jeff. Uh, at some point, is there any benefit to have a campaign to lobby the government to enforce the Canada Health Act? Um, that's that's a great question because because this case originally actually started um, because the Canada Health Act was being enforced and and we saw that um, Brian Day's clinic, Canby Surgeries, was was extra billing and and overbilling patients. The government definitely needs to do a, a better job enforcing the Canada Health Act, um, and and will certainly, you know, as as we uh, move through this campaign, we'll certainly think about that, and we welcome your your feedback um, on how best to lobby um, the government to um, you know have have better enforcement of these of these mechanisms that are in the in the Canada Health Act. Um, Katie, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I I, uh, I would also point to how the, the beginning of this case um, did start um, because th there there are rules that uh, uh, physicians are uh, bound by, um, which are the, the ones that are at stake here. Um, and um, as Osman mentioned, um, Brian Day's uh, clinic was audited, um, and they they did find there there had been extra billing, um, and it was. Uh, when that decision came, it was instead of choosing to actually then follow the law um, and, and pay back that uh, th those uh, fees that had been unlawfully charged, he decided to launch a constitutional challenge against the laws that he had been himself breaking. Um, and absolutely, we should be, if, if there are violations of the Canada Health Act, we should be pointing them out. We should be um, bringing it to the attention of uh, Health Canada. Um, so um, please, if, if, if you um, uh, have had an experience you think uh, is a violation of the, the Canada Health Act, please do get in touch with us um, because it is important um, for um, uh, groups and individuals to sound the alarm when that does happen because um, the, the Health Act uh, is only as strong as its enforcement. And there are monetary um, consequences to provinces if they're not making sure that uh, the Health Act is being followed um, because the, the Government of Canada can withhold uh, transfer payments for health care uh, if there are violations and that has actually happened to BC because of uh, the practices going on. So um, thanks thanks for all, all, um, all of your questions folks um, and and I see that there's, there's there might be some more questions coming in as well uh, but we, we do want to save some time um, to talk a bit about um, how um, how you can support can uh, like how you can support um, our campaign around can be how you can support public health care so um, um, thank you again for the questions and, and Katie I'll, I'll pass it on to you. Uh, for this portion. Great, yes, uh, and thank you again for all the questions. Uh, I know we didn't get to all of them, but don't worry, we, we have them written down um, and we will be following up with participants um, to answer more questions and give you more information. Um, and one of the reasons we're here today, as Osman mentioned earlier, uh, is that um, in addition to giving you an update on, on the case, we wanted to launch our uh, public campaign in support of public health care. Uh, we've seen over the many years we've been involved in this case that the court of public opinion is just as critical as the courtroom itself. Uh, so between now and uh, June 14th, um, when the hearing is heard and then throughout that week, we really need to build momentum um, and show that there is really strong support for pub our public health care system. Uh, as we touched upon earlier as well, uh, Brian Day, the CCF and their corporate allies have long fought for increased privatization in the healthcare system and have deep pockets and no plans to back down. Um, so we're asking people who support public health care uh, to join our campaign by signing a pledge in support of Medicare. Um, to sign the pledge, you can go to savemedicare.ca slash pledge. Uh, we will put a link into the chat box, um, but I'm going to show you just how easy it is to uh, sign the pledge.
All right. <clears throat> so when you go to our website and um, uh, find the pledge, you can just fill out your information here. And all you have to do is your, your name, your email address, and your address, and then say that you pledge your support. And as you can see, um, uh, after that, um, in order to spread the word about the pledge, um, at this point, you can uh, share the pledge itself through your social media, or you can also add a profile picture uh, to show your love for public health care. Um, and so as you can see, once you sign the pledge, you end on this page with a series of options for you to choose from. So whether you're a nurse, a care aide, a doctor, a patient, we've got a frame for you. Um, so to use a, a frame, all you have to do is click the one that you like, and it'll automatically direct you to Facebook where you can apply the frame. There's also a link to a Twitter button that you can use to add to your Twitter frame. So I'll just show you. Uh, all you have to do is click and you can use as your profile picture. Um, we also have a series of share graphics um, that are encouraging others to sign the pledge. Uh, so please feel free to download them, share them, um, and uh, spread the word uh, through social media. Uh, thanks, thanks so much, Katie. And and I, I'm seeing in the chat that um, some folks uh, talking about they're not on social media. So we'll certainly um, share share um, these graphics and some of these resources um, after this webinar over email. And and then you can you can forward the email to your to your friends and family and networks, and and certainly share it outside of uh, social media as well. So. Um, so please, please watch out for that for that email uh, to be coming out. So uh, uh, hopefully, um, hopefully you've you've had a chance to fill out the pledge or or um, have um, are almost done filling it out. And and the nice thing is, once you've signed the pledge, we'll send updates about the campaign, uh, information about the continuing uh, this continuing case, and and any. Um, any other opportunities uh, we might have uh, for you to show your support for, for public health care. So um, thank you for, for taking a few moments to do that. Um, and if you didn't get to it now, uh, you, can, you can certainly um, do it after, after this webinar ends up. Before we wrap up, we did want to acknowledge the immense cost of intervening in this case. Um, to date, the coalition interveners, uh, which are um, the BC Health Coalition and um, Canadian Doctors for Medicare, um, as well as our, our various doctor and, and patient interveners have spent over $550,000 defending public health care in the courts. Our legal team estimates that our work at the BC Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court of Canada will cost an additional $300,000. So, you know, we, we certainly could use your help if you are able to contribute anything to our legal defense fund, we would be really grateful. All of your donations would go directly to our legal um, costs and not the general operation budgets of either the Health Coalition or Canadian Doctors for Medicare. And you can actually donate directly on our website uh, if, you, if you go to the same savemedicare.ca website. And, and of course, you're welcome to also mail a, a check to the BC Health Coalition and, and do please indicate um, that on, on the check that it is a um, contribution to our, to our legal defense fund. So, um, so thank you everyone for, for joining us, for being uh, a part of this, of this case and, and for, for signing on to the pledge if you've um, if you're planning on doing that or have already done that. Um, and, and thank you for, for you know, standing up to protect public health care and for standing alongside us as we take on this case. Uh, before, we, before we wrap up, um, I want to invite uh, Katie or, or Melanie or, or Tom, do you have any final thoughts or, or things you'd like to share with our audience? Uh, I would like to share one final thought that I didn't speak of during my thought is that I am not a good candidate for private insurance and many people with disabilities aren't. And so 
if we go down this road of privatized Medicare in a time where they can uh, look at what pre-existing conditions we have and uh, right from birth, this is a very dangerous road. So it's now more important uh, than ever to have a universal Medicare. Thank you so much, Tom. That is 100% uh, correct and, and really brings home why, why this is so important. Um, and I just wanted to echo the thanks to everyone for being a part of this campaign. Um, we often feel uh, small but mighty, but you make us feel a little bit bigger and a, a, like a bit more of a community going into this. So thank you everyone for being a part of this campaign. Thanks, thanks, folks. So, um, so we'll we'll um, we'll end for for today. And and like we mentioned earlier, we'll certainly provide. Uh, we'll certainly send a, uh, an email out afterwards with with various links where you can go to the pledge. You can share the pledge as well as links to donate to the Legal Defense Fund um, if you if you choose to do so. And we'll keep you updated on this continuing case, um, particularly when we get to the week of June 14 um when we are in court so um thank you again for joining us and um we will be in touch soon <laughs>